you so much for coming this morning after what probably was a fun night last night for you. I know I had a good time. Um, I, uh, I wanted to share with you some of the data that I've been collecting on a stream that I originally went to with a group of students for my restoration ecology class. And I had uh, spoken with Matt Sanders from DEC Regionate over in Avon about, uh, about the fact that this stream had recently been restored. I was looking for examples of places I could take my students to, to work, to think about and to monitor uh, restoration, post-restoration uh, activities. And so we came across Colebrook. It uh, is a really beautiful trout stream. It's one of the treasures, I think, in the Finger Lakes. I've met a number of fishermen in this, uh, along the stream channels here that say that it's the best trout fishing in the state. So I don't know if I'm spilling beans here or not, but, uh, but it has been uh, a really interesting place to study. And um, I've been finding some really interesting things with the respect to the brown and rainbow trout populations uh, there. <coughs> so uh, so the, as I said, the reason why uh, this particular stream is of importance is because not only did I think it was a really cool place to visit, but it's also uh, a place that has been a, a rainbow trout nursery, and a very important one for the region for a long, long time. 30,000 finger, uh, uh, young of the years, or sorry, fingerlings were stocked in 1897. It was a long time ago, uh, but uh, but obviously after uh, uh, the region became an area where fishing and fish culture with Seth Green's uh, history in Rochester, it's been a, a really interesting place to, to come fishing for rainbows. And the DEC goes there every spring. This is our friend Webb Web Pearsall up here. Uh, showing off the catch of the day. Uh, and it's been a, a really great place to actually not only learn about trout, but also to, for the public to recognize what fish they could catch uh, when they come up for the spring runs in, uh, in April. So they, the population has been mostly wildly producing and uh, with a little bit of uh, support in the 1980s with some yearlings that were raised, um, some eggs were captured from uh, a collective from Cayuga Lake and raised at the Bath Fish Hatchery. So uh, really, a really important fishery. Uh, however, the fishermen have not been too happy about the population there and their fishing experience. And as you can see, uh, these are the three major inlets to the, the Finger Lakes, Cuca Lake, Seneca Lake, and uh, Cayuga Lake. Uh, Coldbrook, in particular, was the one who uh, most people said really not a great place to go fishing. They're really not happy about their fishing experience um, that it had been declining. Uh, and, and over the years, DEC has been picking up on this. The spine surveys have not been uh, great, not many, uh, as many rainbows coming back up the stream spawn as some of the other streams like Catherine and Naples, which are uh, uh, much bigger streams as well. And uh, you know things like weather also plays a part of it, but what is it? Is it weather or is it the populations? Is it habitat? Something along those lines. So uh, when we think about uh, this area, if those of you who haven't been there, uh, the Finger Lakes were carved out by the glaciers. They have these really, really steep channels, deep valleys where these inlets uh, are uh, running through. And with the, some of the intense storms that we've had in the summer, 2014 uh, and 15, have had some really intense uh, storm events. That causes some really pro big problems, moving sediment downstream, uh, causing water quality issues, changing the dissolved oxygen levels, temperature, and things like that. Uh, the one other interesting uh, tidbit about this place is that they we have a beaver dam issue, if you will. Uh, beaver dams are not really helpful for rainbows to run upstream, and the the bath fish hatchery folks are um, on an annual basis going down to the lower reaches to remove. Uh, the beaver dams so that the rainbows can run up from the lake. Oops. So uh, this stream was, was a call indicated by the DEC uh, and other folks that it really need to be uh, restored. Something, something needs to be done for the fishing experience for rainbow trout in a nursery. Oops. Okay. Sorry, I thought the mic went out. Um, and so if we think about the, the theory behind restoration, uh, many people would say that if you build it, they will come, right? That 
Can you guys hear me? It's going in and out, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the underlying tenant of all of this is that uh, if you change the habitat, yeah, this is not working well. <laughs> Um, if you change the habitat, you improve the habitat, uh, you will ultimately, you just assume that the, the population and the species or whatnot will come back and, uh, and occupy that area. Uh, but it really requires a lot of monitoring and uh, surveying to figure out if that is actually happening. So the goals of this restoration is, uh, was to improve spawning habitat, to actually create habitat for a holding tanks for the rainbows, the large rainbows running upstream, as well as to prevent or to create that connectivity uh, that between the, the lake and the stream, um, the spawning habitats and the upper reaches. So if you have never been to the Finger Lakes, you should definitely come. We are considered the heart of New York State, um, at least by us. And uh, I, let's see, I work up here and over at Williamsburg Colleges in Geneva, there's Rochester, Syracuse, Cuba Lake um, and Coldbrook is down here, uh, almost into the um, into the another watershed. Uh, but my sites in particular were uh, within the reaches of the restoration. I, mean, I did all post restoration monitoring. I, I started uh, this project after this had been done. My knowledge, uh, DEC had been doing spawning surveys and, re and production surveys. Uh, prior to that initiated this survey, the uh, restoration, but um, I have picked up since uh, 2011 with more monitoring, uh, more frequent monitoring. So you can see that I have two sites uh, within the reaches of the restoration, and uh, within that, uh, the, um, the restoration includes about 3,000 feet of riprap along the banks to stabilize the banks and reduce the sedimentation in the stream channel. Uh, including rock, rock barbs to create habitat uh, for, for the, the trout coming upstream, as well as these rock weirs that cause what we call pool diggers, that essentially are really amazing aquariums for uh, the, the large fish that move upstream. They also did some willow planting to help with the, rest, the riparian buffer, and uh, these, rip, these willows are doing pretty well. Uh, there's actually behind here, whoops. <laughs> Behind here, there's a number of step pools, about four or five of them in a row to uh, make the bend and up a pretty steep slope. So I went out and did an annual electrofishing surveys along the stream at, and more or less spot shocked the, uh, the restored and natural pools because I really wanted to know whether or not the, the fish were using the restored pools uh, more than natural pools. Was, the, was the, the habitat that we had created actually helpful for rearing these trout um, in their first couple of years? Uh, and, and whether or not that was being used differently than the natural pools? So what I what I've also found is that in measuring the pools, the restored pools are two to three times larger than the natural pools, which is the whole point of this, right? We wanted to create more habitat uh, more uh, space for them to uh, to use, more habitat to use, and as well as uh, as um, feed from. And the uh, abundance of fish in these pools were not maybe not what I would expect, right? A lot of habitat space, uh, but many more fish in general at, in the natural pools uh, than the restored pools. If we break that down into the two fish species that I found, uh, primarily browns and rainbows, you can see that over the last five years, the brown trout populations have been increasing in both natural and restored pools, and I'm sorry for the lack of um, differentiation here, but the left bar, this right here, is a natural pool, and this one is a restored pool. But uh, as you can see, the brown trout population has been increasing in these channel, in these uh, pools, both in restored and in natural uh, pools. But the rainbow trout have not been doing too well. The restored pools in particular, in the past when I started uh, the survey, was uh, quite high. And uh, down to uh, last summer even, very, very, very few. Uh, the natural pools seem to not be uh, as preferred habitat as the restored pools for the rainbows, which is good news, kind of success story, but, uh, but the brown seem to be increasing. But if you look at the length of these fish, you'll notice that the, 
the number or the size of the fish is actually increasing for uh, both natural and restored pools. Restored pools generally holding larger fish, which is something that we would also expect and, and hope for. Uh, and if you break this out with the two different species, you'll see that the uh, browns in particular uh, in the restored pools are, uh, the fish in the restored pools are, were much larger uh, when I first started this survey, but really large. Uh, this one up here, as you can see, is a lovely specimen. I caught a, a couple of those that were just enormous, and in these upper reaches, uh, maybe three miles from the mouth of the river, or the mouth of the, uh, the lake. And uh, the natural pools more or less holding uh, smaller fish, sized fish, than the restored fish, uh, restored pools. The rainbows are also increasing in size uh, over time, which is uh, nice to hear, but not really sure what that means, um, other than potentially uh, not having as many in a year, many spawning events, and, and whatnot. But you might say, well, we are getting an average bigger fish, uh, older fish, over the, the last couple of years. When you plot this, uh, the length and the abundance out for these restored and natural pools between the two species, what I th find is interesting is that the brown trout here that are following these points in restored pools are for the most part uh, being a little bit more, uh, more dominant in, in, in their habitat use and, and the fish here, the larger fish, if you're a large fish, you're not found with many others. But if you're a smaller fish, you're found with many, many other brown trout. Uh, same thing for the rainbows, not as much of a relationship here. Uh, and these are, in, again, in the restored pools. Natural pools, relatively similar, uh, but not as much of a, a just difference in the size range of the fish, but also the habitat use. So I think there's a little bit of density dependence going on here. The larger fish are potentially uh, uh, making a presence that, or in some way, uh, preventing other fish from using that habitat. Brown trout are known to have, uh, and other trout uh, and from the literature are known to have uh, produced hierarchical structure, hierarchical structures in their habitats uh, and, and habitat use that uh, potentially would prevent smaller fish from using those pools. Uh, and so maybe that's what's happening here, especially in the, in the restored pools. So what's going on here? What, the, the rainbow trout, they may be getting bigger. There are not as many of them, which is obviously problematic for a place that is known for rainbow trout. Uh, and I think one of the things that, uh, that Brad and Webb uh, and, and I have spoken about recently is that we might be having a little bit of an issue with the brown trout. The, their, present, their presence is a little bit more uh, overwhelming than I think we'd like them to be, at least from a rainbow trout uh, perspective. And uh, one of the pieces of evidence that I captured a couple of years ago is this is a brown trout. I electrofished it with a tail sticking out of its mouth. Uh, and so a little overzealous in its breakfast. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, or lunch I should say, I, I pulled the fish out just to see what it was and sure enough it was a rainbow. Pretty good sized one. So I think that there could be some uh, pretty intense predation occurring here. Uh, and when um, you look at the literature, brown trout are behaviorally dominant and have been shown to induce habitat shifts uh, in rainbow trout and brown trout have, where they're cohabitating. Uh, in particular, their, the refuge sites that they're using uh, may be different between these two fish, but their feeding sites are not the same. We don't have to worry about spawning sites, although they're uh, because of their fall versus spring spawning, but uh, a paper from New Zealand showed that where the overlap, there was overlap between rainbow and, and brown uh, spawning seasons, if you will, and the uh, browns would build a red right over top the rainbows, and so obviously burying the rainbow eggs. Um, and then obviously trout are, are predators. They're pisebars, uh, there's not many, uh, there are not as many of the browns Small browns, the, the rainbows are a perfect place, perfect food source for them. So, uh, one of the things, you know, history plays a big role in this stream, and I think one of the uh, uh, questions is what do we do about managing the stream? The, uh, even in the late 1800s, uh, in, the <laughs> in the New York Times, 
Uh, it was thought that the browns were growing rapidly more than the native trout showed in the brook trout, and their appearance are even more handsomer with red spots being large and very brilliant, and the scales are large, right? So they've been a, a, an attractive uh, specimen in the streams, whether or not that is something that we want to continue uh, in these, in these uh, particular channels is another question. So I thought I'd uh, tie it back together to some of the talks we heard yesterday, thinking about resilience. Um, the, the rainbows are not doing so well, in my view. The, uh, and, and in particular, when you have frustration, you need to restore all aspects of the, the puzzle, including things like dispersal barriers um, and potentially even the, the inter species interactions. Uh, well, maybe my, my talk is over. Um, obviously, uh, restoration needs to be adaptive, monitoring needs to be cont continue in order to tell whether or not this is uh, a success or not, or if there's rest further restoration or different types of restoration needs to occur. And then in light of climate change, like Brady Jackson talked about yesterday, uh, thinking about the frequency of not only temperature, which this is a very cold stream, has been ever since I've been studying it, that hasn't really changed. But the, um, the frequency of storms, which obviously changes the, uh, the, the flooding issues, the channel rerouting issues, which is what initially put this stream um, on the restoration hot list, uh, uh, was a, it's a problem, and that's a problem for the spring spawners like rainbows where they, uh, the uh, fry or the eggs could be washed out. So uh, with that, I'll say thanks to my uh, friends over at Region 8, Brad Webb, uh, Pete and uh, Matt, and then uh, uh, the Drinker Lakes Endowment, and many, many, many undergraduate students here, um, including Matt Pave, who's here at the meeting. So, thanks very much. We have time for a few questions. Mm -hmm. I guess I I'll probably have four or five, and I'll start with one. Um, if you looked any more in detail at the uh, length frequency distributions to try to evaluate whether or not you're having differential effects on younger fish or older fish, which might bias your sizes that you're observing at different years. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't plotted that out yet. Um, I, I have been, uh, this is kind of my first approach at uh, first tackling with the data, but that's definitely on my list to do. Um, I, uh, I generally study um, other fish species. This has been a new 